Hello. Uh, my name is Mr. Johnson. I am a physics teacher and I am here today to talk to you about physics, energy and energy transfers. So I'm just going to share my screen with you. You can see what I'm doing. Okay, thank you very much. So this lesson's about energy forms and transfers. It's a 20 minute lesson and it's meant to help support you for your studies at Key Stage 4. Prior knowledge. So what you should know from Key Stage 3 physics is that energy is always conserved. You should be able to recall and describe the ways in which energy can be stored and transferred and recall and describe ways of reducing energy transfers by heating. By the end of this lesson then, what you should be able to do is describe how energy is stored and transferred in different systems, then explain how to reduce wasted transfers, sorry, of energy, and then finally calculate the efficiency of energy transfers in different scenarios. Jump a little bit there. So what do we actually mean then by energy and energy stores? Well, Lots of people sort of mislabel the idea of energy, but energy is basically the ability to do work on a system to create a change. What that means is if I lift an apple through the height of one meter from a table to the air, or I push a bike across a path, I'm doing work to do that, and that requires energy. If I don't have the energy, I can't make that change. So what do we mean by energy stores then? Well, technically energy can be stored in different ways. Chemical energy stores are found in batteries and fuels such as our food, petrol, diesel, uh, wood, oil, gas. Energy stored in a moving object like a fast moving car, well that's the kinetic energy store. Energy stored in hot objects, hot cup of tea, hot cup of coffee, uh, fire, the toaster, that's the thermal energy store. Energy stored in compressed, twitched, or sorry, twisted or stretched objects is strain or elastic potential energy store. Energy stored in objects in high positions is the gravitational potential energy store. The higher up something actually is, the more gravitational potential energy it stores. Energy stored in the nucleus of atoms is the nuclear or the atomic energy store. Energy stored by two magnets that are in the each other's field that attract or repel each other is the magnetic energy store. And finally, energy stored between two charges that attract or repel each other is the electrostatic energy store. Some of these you'll have met before, some of them will be new to you. They should be made a bit clearer in your uh, key stage four revision guides as well as you know uh, any uh, further reading you do around this. How can energy be transferred then? One of four main ways. Mechanically, if you push someone and they fall over, you've done work on that object, you've applied a force. A force acting on an object and doing work on it is a mechanical way of transferring energy. Electrically, so electricity you know moves through wires, it flows through wires, it's the movement of an electron. An electron's a charged particle, so electrical energy is a charge doing work moving around a resistance, no, sorry, moving around a circuit. Heating. Heat energy can be transferred from a hotter object to a cooler one. For example, the sun is a very hot ball of gas in space. Its heat energy is transferred through space to Earth to make us warmer. Radiation energy transferred by light waves, e.g. light from the sun reaching Earth. Energy transfers then can be represented by transfer flow diagrams like the one that I've drawn here. You don't have to do anything fancy if you're asked to draw a transfer diagram. It's not like you're being asked to draw the objects that they're talking about. In science, we like to be lazy but consistent. Not everyone who goes into science or who's doing a science question can draw like an artist. As a result, we tend to draw things in boxes and give them a label. So we've got the energy stored in a moving car, the kinetic energy of the car on the left. And then the arrow shows the energy is transferred from the kinetic energy store of the car to the thermal energy store of the hot brakes when you apply the brake. This energy is transferred mechanically by force of you putting your foot on the pedal and the brakes being pushed against the wheels during braking. So this is an energy transfer flow diagram. 
conservation of energy then? You might have heard of the term conservation before. Um, you might have heard of it in zoos or uh, in biology. Conservation means keeping things um, constant or making sure that things don't go away. In physics, we use the term system to describe something in which we're studying changes. An example is an electrical kettle and its surroundings forming a system. Energy is transferred by the electrical current in the wires to the thermal energy in the water. As the water then becomes hotter than the surroundings, some of that thermal energy is transferred away through the kettle to the air around it as heat energy, making the air around the kettle a little warmer. Energy can also be transferred away to the environment as sound and light energy. For example, if you've ever stood next to a kettle, even if you're not looking at it, you know if it's near boiling because you can hear it bubbling away. The law of conservation of energy states that energy is not created or destroyed, but transferred from one energy store to another. This means that whatever you think, when energy is put into a system, it's not lost. Even if it seems to disappear, it's just transferred to a different store somewhere. That means then we can use this rule to say that whatever the total value of energy put into a system is, the same value of energy will always be transferred away in total. For example, if I put 100 joules of electrical energy into our kettle, 100 joules of heat, light and sound energy will be emitted from the kettle. In short, total energy input to a system equals the total energy output of a system, or whatever the total energy value goes in equals whatever total energy value comes out. If I put 1500 joules of energy into a system, 1500 joules will be transferred out some way or another energy cannot just appear or disappear. It can't be created or destroyed. So conservation of energy then. Again, still using the term system to describe something in which we're studying changes, but now we're looking at a different system, a worker pushing a box along a surface as shown in the diagram. You can see the worker pushing the box and the force arrow indicates that the box is moving to the right away from the worker. Energy is transferred then by the thrust force of the worker to the kinetic energy store of the box. We say that the worker is doing work against the box's weight to push it along. Friction forces between the ground and the surface of the box transfer some of this energy away to the thermal store of the box, meaning that where the box is in contact with the ground as it's being pushed along, it's getting hotter. Some of that thermal energy is then transferred transferred away to the surroundings, the air around it, as heat energy. So we can say that the work done in moving the box is equal to the energy transferred to the system. The greater the friction force, the faster that the energy is transferred away to the surroundings. And as a result, the faster the man needs to transfer energy to the movement of the box to keep it going. Again, in short, work done to change a system equals energy transfer to the system. It's a really, really often overlooked concept, but the idea is that whatever work you do is equal to the energy you have to have transferred. So work done is the same as energy transferred. If we take that and the idea that the total energy input into a system equals the total energy output, then if I put 1500 joules of energy into a system, 1500 joules is transferred out, so what I have done is 1,500 joules of work because that's what I put in. So that describes how energy is stored and transferred in different systems. Next point, explain how to reduce wasted transfers, transfers of wasted energy. First off, we need to revisit the concept of what wasted energy is. If we think of a light bulb, its purpose is to give out light energy, but that Really, if you think about it, it's not all that it gives out. You turn on a light bulb, it glows brightly. But if you've ever had to repair or replace a light bulb, taking one out of the socket and putting a new one in, you'll realize pretty quickly that it needs to cool down before you can take it out. So it doesn't just give out light. It also gives out thermal energy or heat. Light bulbs give out light. They transfer energy to the room as heat. This heat energy then is lost to the surroundings or the environment. It's still there. We can still account for it, but it's not used for the purpose of the light bulb. It's not actually being used to light the room. And so we say it's wasted. 
the more heat the bulb gives out, the less energy it's got available to light the room. So the more wasted energy has come through. We say that the energy is wasted. Most machines also waste energy as they get hot. Take this bike. As the chain moves through the gear cogs, some of the kinetic energy of the chain, the movement energy of the chain, is transferred to heat energy by friction between the chain and the cog as they're coming into contact and rubbing against each other. This heat is then spread out from the gear cog, which is getting warmer than the air around it, to the atmosphere, the air around it, meaning that it can't then be used to help push the bike along. In effect, it is wasted. So how can we reduce wasted energy? Well, in this case, we can use a thermal insulator to reduce wasted energy as heat. If you think of your home, whenever you put the heating on, the last thing you want is to pay for heating to keep your room warm and find that most of it is going out of the windows or the walls. So you close your windows, which contain glass to keep the heat in. You might close your curtains. If you have um, a very modern house, you might have very thick insulation in your walls and in your loft. All these things act as thermal insulators to prevent heat escaping to the surroundings and reduce wasted energy. If we increase the insulation, then less heat transfers away to the surroundings and it remains in the system. This means less energy is wasted, so more of the energy transferred is useful for its original purpose. Insulation is used to line buildings and thermal flasks, your thermos, the mug that keeps your tea or coffee warm in the morning. For mechanical, like this one here, we can use a lubricant such as liquid and even sometimes a gas to help reduce friction. If we reduce friction, we reduce the force that's acting to transfer energy away from the system as heat, meaning that less heat is passed out. This means less energy is wasted again, so more of the energy transferred is used to make the machine work. We say that the energy is useful. It's one of the reasons why if your bike gets rusty and you oil it, it becomes easier to ride than it does if it remains unoiled. So that explains how to reduce transfers of wasted energy. Our final one is a calculation. Calculate the efficiency of energy transfers in different scenarios. Efficiency is the term that physicists use to describe how well a machine transfers energy usefully. It's set on a scale, and the scale's from zero to one. Zero is the lowest efficiency, all energy transfer is wasted. One is the highest efficiency, where all energy transferred is useful. Just to complicate matters, in the shops, if you go and buy a TV or a washing machine or a fridge, instead of using zero to one, they use letters of the alphabet from A to G, where A is the most efficient and G is the least efficient. The thing is, even if we go back to the zero to one scale, most machines are somewhere in between this. There's no machine with an efficient efficiency rating of zero. If it did that, all the energy would be wasted and the machine just wouldn't work. At the same time, there's no machine on earth, as we know, that has an efficiency rating of one. All things waste energy. It's just built into them. Because of moving parts, because of resistance, it's got to be overcoming circuits. It's just one of those things. As a result, you can get very efficient machines but nothing that is at zero or one. Calculating efficiency then. We can calculate the efficiency of an appliance or a machine if we know a few things about it. We need to know, one, how much energy it transfers usefully. So what is the total useful transfer? The total energy transferred to the appliance, how much has gone in altogether to the system? The equation that we use for this is efficiency equals useful energy output divided by the total energy transferred. As a general rule, if you accidentally mix these two up, your efficiency would come out higher than one. So if, for example, you said in an exam, because you're in a rush and you're panicking, efficiency is total energy divided by useful energy, your answer would come out somewhere above one. But we know that efficiency should be somewhere between zero 
and one. So at that point, all you have to do is make sure that you've got your terms the other way around. Efficiency equals useful energy over total energy. And that'll give us a value somewhere between zero and one, which lets us know we're on the right track. For example, let's compare two hair dryers for their efficiency. I want the most efficient of the two. Hair dryer one uses 26,000 joules and it transfers 20,000 joules usefully. That means its total energy in is 26,000 joules and the useful energy is 20,000 joules. Hair dryer two uses 19,500 joules and transfers 16,500 usefully. So for hair dryer two, the total energy is 19,500 and the useful energy is 16,500. In comparison, which one's the most efficient? If we do the calculation, for hair dryer one, the equation is efficiency is useful energy output over total energy transferred. The answer is efficiency equals 20,000, the useful energy output, divided by 26, the total energy output, and it gives us an efficiency rating of 0 0.77. Notice what I've done here. I've wrote the equation first, and then I've placed the values that I know into the equation. I've used the equation as a map. This is really important in GCSE physics, because if you do this, it shows the examiner that you know what you're doing and you know what the equation is, you've not guessed. Also, sometimes we make mistakes on calculators. If you get the answer wrong and you have laid it out like this, and the only thing is that you've put, for example, 21,000 divided by 26,000 on your calculator, because you've wrote your values in, you will still score marks. You will just lose the mark for the final answer. So it's very important to show you're working. Getting back to our question, hair dryer two, same layout again. The equation is efficiency equals useful energy output divided by total energy transferred. The answer, efficiency is 19,500 joules divided by 16,500 joules. And the efficiency is 0 0.85. There are no units for efficiency. Because we're dividing a value in joules by another value in joules, the units cancel out. And so efficiency has no units. Now you might be saying, hang on, sir. Sometimes we have this in percentages. Well, that's fine. You can calculate efficiency in percentages. You do the same thing that we've done here and then multiply the final decimal by 100 to give you the percentage. You can also use scale drawings called Sankey diagrams to represent the energy transfers. The beauty of a Sankey diagram is that it shows the total energy, the useful energy and the wasted energy transfers and the amount is stored in one whole picture. Here's a Sankey diagram, energy in fuel, heat losses in the environment, used in the power station, lost in transmission, delivered to customers. It's a lot better if we take that and put it onto something that gives us a sense of scale like graph or square paper. The scale that I'm using here shows that the total energy is equal to five boxes. That total energy for this question is 100 joules. So if 100 joules is five boxes, one box must be 20 joules, which I've arrived at by dividing 100 by five boxes. The scale here shows that the energy delivered to the customer is one and roughly three quarter boxes. That represents then 35 joules. I've taken the value for one box, 20 joules, multiplied it by one and three quarter or 1.75 and it gives me an answer 35 joules. The scale also shows that the heat lost to the environment in transmission and the power station is three and one quarter boxes. This represents 65 joules, 20 joules times three boxes. Now the important thing here is that energy in must equal the energy out. And if you look carefully, you'll see that the energy delivered to the customer is 35. If we add that to the 65 for the energy losses, that's 100 joules out in total. So it's kept the principle of conservation. Total energy in equals the total energy out. That is our final learning outcome, calculating the efficiency of energy transfers in different scenarios. I hope you've enjoyed this and if you have any questions feel free to get in contact using the details at the end. Thank you very much for your time.